All righty, folks, welcome back. And I'm so glad you're with us in this uh, second half. And I understand maybe the phone isn't working to call in on. If you want to try it and see, we appreciate it. If you give it a shot, we tried with our phones here and it worked okay. But 304 591 6993, if you give it a call and see it's working, we'd appreciate it very much. Uh, it's a call in line. I hope the listen line is working okay. But technology, folks, is wonderful when it works, <laughs> it just doesn't always work very well. We're going to finish a teaching I started last time, and the teaching, folks, is very serious. It's this teaching that I take, I don't know more. It's heavy on my heart to know that I'm teaching something that may literally cost somebody their life one day. Maybe, maybe a little bit of a way I can relate to Jonas Clark and Lexington Green, where he taught his people that we have, to, we have to defend what's right, no matter what the cost, and somebody's being died right there in Lexington Green. Hello? Hello? Hey, hello, Pastor. Can you hear me? I can. It's working. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Hey, I'll, I'll let you go. You guys, it's nice seeing everybody's smiling face. Well, <laughs> I, I told Nick, behave yourself. He said, doing the best you could. Well, we've been watching him. We got, we got uh, yeah, another couple watching here, too, and he's just, he's just a heathen. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think 99% of everything you hear about me is probably true. <laughs> <laughs> yep, okay, I, I appreciate you telling the truth. <laughs> hey, uh, you, you, you tell, you, Dick, we, we love everybody and even Dick too. <laughs> you know, I can get my flaws from Tom Nick and Adam to learn to love me. I don't know. Oh, gracious. Well, thanks, Ash. Let us know it works. Thank you so much. Hey, I'll catch you later. Okay, bye bye. There's a sweet fella. He really is. Anyway, we started teaching that I really take very seriously entitled. God's people are the militia of God. Here, it's in the and it's something that I don't take lightly at all. You know, I was over at the Jackson Meat Department, some of you West Virginia, about a month ago. Run to a preacher named Diver Danbury. Nick might know it, I don't know. Diver Danbury. He's been around there a long time. And he was sitting there in the store talking to people. He's talking to me. He said, he said I want to tell you something, good. He said, I was at the church the night over at Oak Hill, down Oak Hill. And out there with Dale Stone another guy he's been to church with. And he, he was preaching there. He said, Pastor Butch Paul prophesied this was going to happen 20 years ago. What's happening in the country? Not, I said, I'm not a prophet, but I can see it coming. Mm -hmm. He said, you prophesied, and everybody thought you were crazy, but you would see what's happening today. He said, and Dale Stone stood up in the testimony and said, he's telling the truth. Butch Paul told us this 20 years ago. Now, I'm not taking credit for anything. I'm not that smart. But if you read the Bible, you read the, you read the next steps going to happen to a society. And now California is trying to teach children that being a pedophile is normal. Y'all know that. I said it last time. I'm telling the truth, Steve. I am. But it seems like whatever California tries to do, our dad's do, we end up doing it. We do. But you know, uh, I was in Marville grade school. It's been a long time ago. And a teacher named Mr. Presso. Dick Mr. Presso. He's a, he's a principal of school. He's teaching one time about telling the truth. And he said, most people don't give a tinker's damn. Everybody in the went, oh. He said, why y'all, oh, that's not a curse word. He said, y'all don't know what a tinker's damn is, do you? And, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't know. So he said, a tinker's damn is when he's working on a piece of metal. He doesn't want, the, doesn't want the metal to get hot below a certain point. He'll take a piece of clay and block the water off at the level he wants it to stop. Or the solder. Yeah, the solder. So that's called, it's, it's, it's a piece of clay. It's called tinker's dam. For the tinker making so some people don't give enough to be worth the tinker's damn because they don't want to hear the truth. Now I'm telling the gospel truth right now. They don't want to hear because they think if they don't hear it, they're not accountable for it. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Ignorance is there's no plea of, of innocence. The judge would always say ignorance is no excuse for not following the law. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. but I want, I want, I've got some scripture passed out here that I want to read if you don't mind. But I'll ask Joe to look up Hebrews chapter 13. Now, this verse sticks, has stuck in my mind for a lot of years. <coughs> Hebrews 13, verse 17 says, What, Joe? Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, 
He's talking about church authority. A pastor, listen to what he's saying because he has to give account for your soul. If you don't think that's scared me, you're crazy. That's why I cannot compromise the word, Phil. If somebody goes to hell on my watch, whose fault is that? Yours. And Mark chapter 7, would you read verse 20, please? And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. Go on. For from within, from, from within, out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lavishness, and I, an evil eye. Blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. Did you understand what you said? <clears throat> In order to know the man, you look at the fruit. If you see evil in the man or woman's life, you know that your heart's full of evil. Is that what it says? Yes. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says what, Marcia? It is. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness and of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We wrestle. Now we're seeing them. This manifest in the flesh. We're seeing evil in the flesh. But folks, it starts in the spiritual world. Evil in a man's life comes from the heart of man, his spirit. Good also comes out of the heart of man or his spirit. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? So when you see a physical rape or a physical murder or a physical theft, theft, theft that is it started first in the spiritual side of that man. And is man's spirit without Christ corrupted or not? Okay. Yep. Evil Christ spirit. How many of y'all fight yourself? Oh yeah. But understand that Lynn, we're fighting against physical forces, but it comes from the spiritual side. Do you really, how many of y'all know that de the devil has a kingdom? Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. How many of y'all know that he has hierarchies in the kingdom? Yeah. Yep. Spiritually and physically, he has hierarchies. He also has a government. Of course, that's part of the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. The hierarchy can be with, with the Illuminati, the, the, the Masons, or whatever, but they are, there are hierarchies in the, in the kingdom of Christ or in the kingdom of Satan, just like there are in the kingdom of Christ. Do you, um, you comprehend what I'm saying to you? So what we're seeing now today, Phil, that may lead to bloodshed physically one day, is the spiritual world manifests itself in this time. You understand that? Mm -hmm. And you as a man in Christ, or woman in Christ, must determine beforehand what, your, what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do to do what's right in the future. you got to know that. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11 says what, Dick? Because sin is speaking and evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the Son of Man is full of seek and then to do. He said because you don't punish evil quickly, and severely, it's in the heart of man to do more evil. That's America. Today. That's America. That's yeah. That's a child even. Yes. Am I right? Yes. If you don't stop evil, it will take over society, folks. Who did Christ put here to stop evil? Church. The church. Who was told to occupy till he come? The church. Church. Feel your thinking off of heart. I can see that. The power of attorney for him. Exactly. We have authority in him. Yes. To understand the folks that I'm lining this up to bring some points here. If a man is going down your street murdering people and you have a ways to stop him but you don't, are you accountable for the next murder? Yes, yes. yes you are. There you go. And in, in Proverbs 25, <coughs> verse 26, it says this. Now pay attention. A righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. A righteous man who bows to wickedness, to wicked people, is corrupt. Feel what I do with that. Can't do anything with it except reveal it. That's all I know to do. Mm -hmm. I have a, in a hand here a article about some pastors, a pastor in uh, Africa, Name's Pastor Pierre 
oaked. He had been spending 40 years preaching in a church in a, in a village, uh, in a Sargadi, Sargadja village. He was preaching on one weekend, and some people come up on motorcycles, put guns at the, at the Christian's head, and said, either refute, either deny, deny Jesus or we're going to kill you. So they killed this man and five church members. So they, wouldn't, they wouldn't deny Christ. Now, this is in Africa. They never had the American freedoms. They never had the Bill of Rights. They're not allowed to have weapons. It's a police state, and they were shot for their faith. Now, in America, we were given much more. And to whom much is given, much is required. Is that true? Yes. So I want you to understand, this is happening around the world, and America is not immune to persecution. And the Christian church is going to be persecuted. Now, what do you mean, preacher? I'm going to tell you this. Christ himself said, if the world loves you, you're none of mine. And if you love the world, you're none of mine. What's the world? It's the big Evil. church with a few hundred people congregation. A few thousand. Who play with the world system. The world, the world, the, no, we're not talking about the earth. The earth is created by God and it's gorgeous. We're talking about a world system, a man system, a government, a man system of religion. And if you're a friend with the man system of religion and world government, you're an enemy of Christ. Yeah. I'm talking about evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And did, did Christ tell us that if they persecuted him, they persecute us? Yeah, he did. And if we live in a society as wicked as today, you're not being talked about. You're not doing something right. If a righteous man falls down before the wicked, then he is not a righteous man. No, he's not. He never was to begin with. There's a, there, there's a problem. I can't remember where it's at. I just read it the other day. It talks about when the righteous give in to the wicked, we come under judgment. Oh, yes. We are. Yeah. yeah. But understand, folks, I'm not talking about something here that's pie in the sky and 22,000 years in the future. I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about America, 2019. I'm talking about a time in, in this nation that I never thought I'd live to see. I never dreamed this would happen in my lifetime. I never thought I'd ever see a day when homosexuals could get married and call it normal, and adopt children. And on TV, on the commercial, they show two men with children. I don't get it. Where is the church? In the closet. Clean bingo. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> John, yeah, honey. Let's speak loud. Yeah, sucking on, sucking on sugar tea. Yeah. It's my son. <laughs> John Jay, the first Chief Justice Supreme Court, y'all know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. He wrote this on September 13, 1779, serving as president of the Continental Congress. John Jay approved the circular letter from the Congress of the United States of America to, to, the, to their constituents, friends, and fellow citizens. In governments raised on this, on this generous principles of equal liberty, the rulers of the state are the servants of the people and not the masters of those from whom they derive authority. Right. The ungrateful despotism and inordinate, inordinate lust of, dis, of domination, which marked the unnatural designs of the British king and his bill on the parliament to enslave the people of America, reduced you to the necessity, now pay attention, the, the evilness of the king and his government reduced the people to the necessity of either asserting your rights by arms or ingloriously passing under the yoke. Comprende? Mm -hmm. I understand. Remember, we are get, continuing against the kingdom crumbling into pieces, the nation without public virtue, but betrayed by their own representatives, against a prince governed by his passions, against a government by the most impious violations of the rights of religion, Justice, humanity, and mankind, courting the vengeance of heaven and revolting from the protection of providence. Have we revolted from God as a people? Yes. 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 And there can be and can there be any reason to apprehend that the divine depositor of human events, after having separated us from the house of bondage and led us safe through a sea of blood toward the land of liberty and promise will leave the work of our political redemption unfinished or suffer us to be carried back in the chains of that country of oppression from whose tyranny he hath mercifully delivered us with an outstretched arm. God did not bring us back into tyranny. We brought ourselves back into tyranny. Should we revolt against the government that's ungodly? Ah, uh, yes. Yes. 
And you know, when they talk about standing against it, I don't necessarily mean that as of yet with a weapon in your hand. But to stand against the principles of a wicked man in government is godly. Would you all agree with that? Pick up against but the it. other side <laughs> is quiet and <clears throat> cognitive of the fact that it's going to come to the time and they're getting oh, yes. prepared mentally. And they're pushing that direction. Yeah, yeah. Now, I read last time, I'll, I'll take off briefly where I left off. The Second Amendment was meant to pay police pay attention was meant to be a strong moral check. Now, catch that word. A moral check against the usurpation of arbitrary powers of rulers. A moral check. How can the right to bear arms be a moral check? What's that mean? Somebody tell me. The duty to bear arms. How is it a moral check? Keep it. Go ahead, John. It's keep us in check to say that we, as a people, have a right no, not a right, a duty to defend ourselves, to feed ourselves, to take care of us. If also if the government steps out of line, that's the check. We have the right to intervene, if it come, even if it comes to revolution. Well, even the Declaration of Independence said it's a duty. Did it not? Yes. Now, morally right. Now, folks, this is Bible. God help me explain this right, please. In order to be morally right, you must be biblically sound. <coughs> Let me repeat that. <coughs> In order to be morally right, you must be biblically sound. You understand what you said? Mm -hmm. If it's contrary to the word of God, it's not moral. No matter what man says, it's not moral. Comments, Phil? Correct. Let's uh, look it up in the uh, 1828 Webster's Dictionary. There you go. Did not, uh, did not the righteous creator give, and he mentioned this last time before we, before we close, the animal creation a means of self-defense? Did he not? Or at least a means of flight? Yeah. Did he not? And, and, and I don't care how timid that animal may be. You grab a mouse, and, and a mouse will run from you, vegetarian. you grab a mouse, and it's still alive, what's it going to do? Bite, 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 bite. Why would it bite you? Depending himself. It's self defense. Yeah. Yes. Or a squirrel or a rabbit or whatever it may be. They, they give he gives them a way to flight when necessary, but also a means to fight when necessary. If he would do that for the creation of animals, how much more would we do it for man? And how much more accountable are we to than animals to man, than that? Mm -hmm. How much more have we been given? So the animals are being more obedient to God's creation than we are. Exactly. Do you get a Bible now? Look up, look up Luke. I'll read to you what Patrick Henry said. Ever, ever heard of Patrick Henry? Yeah. He wrote this in a, an article called The Debates in the Civil State Conventions. Now let him candidly tell me where and when did freedom exist when the sword and the purse were given, taken from the people. Where did freedom exist when the sword and purse were given up from the people? Luke 22, 36 says what, Bill? Twenty-two, thirty-six. Yes. It's toward the end, isn't it? <laughs> Pretty close, yeah. Okay. Now, folks, listen to the wording, because this is what Patrick Henry said. This man was a preacher and a Bible scholar. Luke 22, 36 says what? Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse... Let him take it, and likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Henry just said, when the purse and the sword is taken away, you lose. We no longer control the purse, do we? Who can who controls the money in this nation? The politicians, the money grubbers, the money changers, the Federal Reserve, the IMF. We've lost the purse. And they're trying to take away the sword. Mm -hmm. And Henry said, if you lose it, you'll lose everything. Well, did Patrick Henry said, I pray a politician, don't turn the politics toward the purse? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> but stop and think, folks, how, how Christ said that 2,000 years ago. Henry quoted again in the 1700s. If you lose control of the purse strings, the government can do what it wants, but it controls the money. Yeah. Because it's your money. Yeah. Now, let's face it, folks. The masses have lost their spiritual light and courage to do anything to fight. 
the masses have. As I said a little while ago, two, two major controlling factors, fear is number two. Fear is number two on the list because it controls people by fear and motivates them by fear. But the biggest controller of everything is a false hope. Mm -hmm. Keep people hoping for the rapture or whatever because we're, we're going to be out of here. Or Republicans are going to make it better. Oh yeah, or Trump's going to save us. <laughs> He goes on to say, unless a miracle in human affairs interpose, no nation ever retains liberty after the loss of sword and uh, sword and purse. Tell me, just real quickly, have we lost our earnings? Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Who gets a cut first? Is it God? No. No. It's no. it government. And if you sell your time, is time not the essence of life? Mm -hmm. Think you're selling your time to earn a living. Should that not be yours by divine creation? Yeah. But man says no, doesn't he? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, anyone that has access to Black's Law Dictionary, the seventh edition or before, look up the term riot tenure. It's the last um, term in, under ours. And riot tenure was defined years ago as when the peasants think they own the land, but the government sets the tax rate, so therefore the government is setting the rent. Mm -hmm. They call it tax, but yeah. it's rent, because you've got to pay it or you lose it. And in the Black's Law Dictionary, it says it is the worst form of slavery that is practiced in the West Indies. It names the places. That's because that was not practiced here. That's right. It is now. Mm -hmm. So we are slaves when the government sets the tax rate, at which point you will lose your property. You, you have no say in it. Well, we know <laughs> someone is right now, right? We know someone now very little. Yeah, every, every time we turn around, we see taxes going sure. up. We see now municipal taxes where mm -hmm. cities can tax you. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah. plus inflation itself is a tax. County taxes. So you we know, lost the purse. We're taxed Fire to death. Taxes. So should we give up the sword? No. We don't even have real money. No, we don't. Which in the Constitution <laughs> was defined because they understood the power of the purse. So therefore, they wanted an honest money system, which we don't have. Right. And also, mm -hmm. where did they get the idea of gold and silver for money? Where did it come from? Wow. Bible. 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 Yeah. The great object is that every man be armed. Everyone who is able may have a gun. Don't need a permit or a license from the Word of God. Exodus 22. Let's read it real quickly. Exodus 22. Yes. If you look up, look up First Timothy, if you don't mind. Why, why we're First Timothy chapter five. Exodus 22 says this. In verse two. Now pay attention. If a thief be found breaking up, or I mean breaking in, and be smitten that he die, there should be no blood shed for him. In other words, the man who had to take his life is totally innocent. He's defending his home right. and his yeah. family. Right. And that was a one time of common law. It was never, never questioned. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Now, my question is this. If a man is found breaking in and the head of the house has no weapons, whose fault is that? The head of the house. The the house. You go. So therefore, if the family is murdered and raped and slain, who, who bears part of the blame? You do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just kneel and pray, right? The state police told Roy Ball here in the house of Broke into. He said, when you, they come on your property and you want to shoot them, you don't shoot them in the back. You shoot them head on, but kill them. Yeah. The state police told that. Yes. So we can't went, stop it, but you can. When all that was going on past, you know? Yeah, I remember. And it, they told me, you know, the outer, the outer. They, they told me, you know, get him, <laughs> drag him, drag him in the house. <laughs> yep. First Timothy chapter 5. Very important scripture. I just read to you in Exodus 22 2 about a man defending his home. You're going to find out, folks, it's not a right. It's not a right. It's a duty. First Timothy chapter 5. You still get there. Take your time. I'm going to get this out. I've talked to preachers about guns with holes in the Bible. It's the right to keep them very good. Well, I've read through and through several times. I can't find that in there. They don't know the Bible. First Timothy chapter, now folks, pay attention. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says what, Phil? But if anyone provide not for his own, and especially for those 
of his own house. He hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Mm -hmm. I mean, I looked up the word provide in the black or in the in the 18 point dictionary, what the word provide means. That just means provide food and shelter. It means provide protection, a means of protection. And God, and the scripture tells us that you, if you don't protect your family and take care of your family, you deny the faith and are worse than an infidel, and infidel does not go to heaven. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you go to church five times a week. I don't care if you testify and sing all day long. If you won't even defend and take care of your home, take care of your home, you're an infidel. To men that won't work, too lazy to work, living off somebody else, they're infidels. Yep. Am I telling the truth, Steve? Yes, sir. So is it a, is it a right for me to protect my family or a duty by from the eyes of God? Duty. That's duty. a commandment duty. from God yep. straight on to provide for my home. No. God help me. No, no Christian, no real believer wants to ever shed blood. I've had so-called Christians frown at me because I pack a gun. I oh, yes. What? Well, then Christ just tell us, Luke 22, 3, 6, to get well, a sword. He tell his disciples, say, exactly. don't buy a gun. Exactly. That's what he said. Now, go ahead and look, turn to Nehemiah. We'll get the Nehemiah here. Nehemiah, just in a second. Joe Barlow wrote in an article here, this is, uh, he uh, spoke, he uh, said, in, in advice to privilege orders in the several states of Europe, he said, he's writing an article here, he said, the foundation of everything, everything is that the people will form an equal representative government, that the people will be universally armed. The people will be universally armed. Yeah. Universally means what, Phil? Select a few? 100%. So we read, are you read in Numbers chapter 1, then, where God said, you will arm yourselves? Mm -hmm. Did you read that? Was it in there? Make it up? Yep. And a people that legislate for themselves ought to be in the habit of protecting themselves. That's what he said. Now, people that want to govern themselves must protect themselves. It's not the government's duty to protect you, or house you, or clothe you, or feed you. It's your duty to do justice when crime is done, but they're not to live in your home and tell you how to, how to do it. You understand what I just said? It's not their duty to see my wife eat. If I can't work and I want to, whose duty is it to feed my wife? Nobody. Family. Well, think about it. How about the church? Church, family, and friends. Your brother. Yeah, your brothers. Your brothers and sisters. I, I know for sure. It's going to have to be that Marsha would eat from now on. Nobody's going to let her start this as long as you're alive. But it's not the government to step in and say, here, you take this, you take this, you take that. That's not what it's... No, 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 no. But now, see, we don't need to protect yourself. we got the state police, the, the sheriffs. we got the federal government. We don't need help from God anymore, do we? The only difference in goods between me owning a gun and defending my wife at the moment a thief breaks into my home is I can do an immediate response. If I dial 911, if it's going to take, they say, a minimum of 20 minutes, and they come in my house to take care of the thief, then he may be long gone. Oh, it's too, too late. Yeah, he may be long gone, and my wife and I will be laying in a pool of blood. Yeah, but he comes yeah, in the same work. Body guard. Yeah, he's people. Well, I mean, yeah. Nehemiah chapter, four. Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. God's people went back to the promised land. And they were going to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, the church, the so-called sanctuary city. They're, they're going to rebuild Jerusalem. And God said, y'all go on back, you're going to do a thing. Just sit down and watch and I'll build it for you. <laughs> right. he, he said, don't worry about things. And I'll make sure y'all protected. I'll put up angels around you. And you don't worry about anybody being armed, protect themselves. Just go back in there. Trust in me. I'll, ta I'll give you food stamps and welfare. I'll take care of you. Nehemiah chapter 4 says this. But when it come to pass that when Sanballat heard that, that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in the day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Amorite was with him. He said, even that which they build, if your fox would go up on them, he shall even break down the stone wall. So if the people of God decide to rebuild, it's no big deal. It'll fall down. Hear, hear, o, hear o our God, for we are despised and turn the reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. Woo! The Christian said, you punish them, God. 
You're what they said. You take care of that. You, uh, that vengeance is yours. Go for it. And cover it, and covet not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. In other words, don't forgive them what they're going to do to us. That doesn't sound like a Christian to me. So, so built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together until the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. They had a mind to build the wall and to and to build up, rebuild this kingdom of God. But doesn't it say in, in the Bible that the vengeance is belongs to Yeah, him vengeance belongs to him, right. Right. Yeah. The self defense belongs to us. And they're fumbling right. around about how many uh, and drop down to verse fourteen. <clears throat> verse fourteen. And I looked and I rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible. I mean it's awesome. And fight, fight for your brethren, your sons, <coughs> your daughters, your wives, and your houses. That's protecting us. I don't get it. Where was their faith? Can not God take care of them? <coughs> And it came to pass when our enemies had heard that it was known unto us that, and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned to all of us to the wall, everyone unto, unto his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of our servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held spear, both spears and shields, and the bows and the habergons, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They which built it on the wall, they, they that bear burdens, and with those that laid it, everyone with one hand, one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand he held a weapon. Mm -hmm. For the builders, everyone had his sword girded by his side, right. and so built it. And he, and he the sound of the trumpet was by me. In other words, you arm yourselves and ready to fight. Ready to watch. Now, they didn't attack. Now, let me make a point here. They didn't attack. No. They didn't attack. What did they see that stopped them, perhaps? Arms. That the people were armed. Arms, yeah. mm -hmm. arms had defrayed a lot of attacks. Yep. People know that you may be armed, don't attack you too often, do they? No. Any comments so far? Now, back to that. I want to read a few more here before we get it further here. Jeffrey R. Schneider wrote this. Classical re Republican philosophy has long recognized the critical relationship between personal liberty and the possession of arms by people ready and willing to use them. <coughs> Phil, how do, you, how do you figure that? Marcus Tullius Cicero. Ever heard of Cicero? Mm -hmm. There existed law, inborn in our hearts, there existed law that's naturally in our hearts, that if our lives are endangered by plots or violence or armed robbers or enemies, any and every method of protecting yourselves is morally right. Mm -hmm. See, this isn't my thoughts. This isn't my, I'm not the first one to think of this. Mm -hmm. How many have ever heard of Montesquieu? I have. Is it, it is unreasonable to oblige a man not to attempt the defense of his own life. Phil, what do you think? Well, it's even said you can defend yourself from the government, from policemen or whatever. Uh, you still have the right to defend yourself just because it doesn't matter who they are. That's true. I don't care they're wearing a badge. Still, still defend yourself. You know, we've got the idea more, and, and to a point it's okay, to respect law enforcement. But when they become the perpetrators of crime, that's got to end. I don't care if they're wearing a badge and carrying a gun. They're still wrong. Right. Well, does it come down to resisting tyranny as obedience to God? Well, we're going to read, yes. We're going to read in a minute about the attack in Lexington Green. Now, I want you to remember, and remember some of these thoughts, please. They come in uniform of the military. Of, of, now, listen, this was not a foreign army. This was the British army, and they were British citizens. Mm -hmm. Were they not? Yeah. Yeah. The Massachusetts Providential Congress of Massachusetts, October 26, 1774, organized their defenses with one third of the regiments being men and men ready to fight at a, a minute's notice. They got the idea from the Bible. Woo! Got the idea from the Bible. Wow. Where in ancient Israel, every man was armed and ready to defend his family and community. Numbers chapter 1 again. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man had his sword upon his thigh. Now, we failed to teach that to the children. Hmm. We failed to recognize that the first covenant is still the word of God today. That's right. Everyone with one of his hands wrought in the words, of course, quoting them out. Uh, but it goes on saying, uh, E.C. Wines wrote in, in commentaries on the laws of ancient Hebrews, Moses, uh, Moses' constitution made no provision for a standing army. Who was it said that 
the standing army, the bane to liberty. Bane to <coughs> what that Thomas Jefferson said that. Mm -hmm. The standing army is a bane to liberty. Why is that? When a king commands armed forces in peacetime, what do you call that? An occupying army. Yes. The whole body of citizens formed a national guard. Uh, David B. Cobble wrote this in ancient Hebrew Muslim Militia Law. New Englanders intensely self-identified with ancient Israel. Thus, in ancient, thus, ancient Hebrew Militia Law is part of the intellectual background of the American Militia System and of the Second Amendment. You understand what you said? They got that in the Second Amendment and militia from the scriptures. The militia was not a military. They were private citizens armed to protect themselves, their, their states, and their nation, if necessary. Of course, it goes on to say, we this every male from age 20 and up, years and up, had to be armed. It was access, it was just, uh, we read in, uh, where was that? I just read, I, it, where, I mean, in a war book. Aristotle wrote this in parts, of, uh, in parts of animals. Animals have just one method of defense and cannot change it for another. For man, on the other hand, many means of defense are available and he can change them at any time. Take the hand, this is as good as a tiling, or the claw, or a horn, or again, a spear, or a sword, or any other weapon or tool, it can be, it can be all of these. Aristotle uh, also said, those who possess and can weld arms are in position to decide whether the Constitution is to continue or not. <laughs> what happened? Somebody tell me what happened, Phil. How did we lose it? One step at a time. Now, how would you know, by the way, what the Constitution is if you haven't read it? That's why they don't teach it in the schools. That's right. <clears throat> I don't know when took it out. Uh, Thomas Jefferson said it, and to be injured and free is something that never was and never can be. If you don't know the truth, you don't know what to stand for. See, Sarah Pressarella wrote on crimes and punishment, false is the idea, now pay attention, that would, fire, that would take fire from men because it burns and water because it may, you may drown in it. You understand that? Mm -hmm. The laws that forbid the carrying of arms are laws of such a nature. They disarm those only who are neither inclined nor determined to commit crimes. <laughs> only the law-abiding will give up the guns. Yeah. Criminals don't care. If criminals obey laws, they wouldn't have any crime. Duh. <laughs> so they take away water because you might drown in it. Can't be water. You can't take away fire, you might burn yourself. Same way you take away guns, you might hurt yourself. <laughs> Can it be supposed that those who have the courage to violate the most sacred laws of humanity who respect the less important and arbitrary ones which can be violated with ease and impunity. Such laws serve rather to encourage than to prevent homicides. An unarmed man may be attacked with greater confidence than an armed man. Why would government want to disarm the people? So they're going to, to keep the peace, of course, Bill. <laughs> Go take care of it. So it's, all, it's all about keeping the peace. Well, how many the politicians have guards being paid to carry their guns for them. Of course. Yep. Oh, they're all surrounded by the Cincinnati and the Tums. Yeah. We can't afford pay no one, so we've got to carry our own guns. Yeah. And the Thomas Paine wrote, the peaceful part of mankind will be continually overrun by the vow and abandoned while they neglect the means of self-defense. Who was it said? And I, I can't even have the top of my head. Who he wrote the uh, he wrote about the gulags? He said if we would just met them at the door with pokers and shovels and so yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that we may have sent them home. I feel lost for you, okay? The, the supposed quietude of a good man allures the ruffian. By the other hand, arms like laws discourage and keep the invader and the plunder in awe and preserve order. You know, I just second in first Timothy chapter one verse eight through nine said laws are given for the lawless, not for the lawful. Please ask A. Lebo, we just read a minute ago. If you don't punish evildoers, they spread. Mm -hmm. right? Sometimes you got to give the people time to catch wake up and oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Get but, you know, but if you listen to the A Society, especially to me, my words, they consider caning someone or whipping somebody or putting someone in stocks as cruel and unusual punishment. But our daddy's dropped another belt across our butt side and made it sting. Yes, he did. <clears throat> Thomas Moore wrote, men and women alike assiduously exercise themselves in military training to protect their own territory, to drive an enemy out of their friend's land, 
or in pity for a people of Presbyterian. Mitchabelli wrote, citizens when legally armed did the least mischief to any state. Did you hear what I just said? Mm -hmm. Rome remained free for 400 years and Sparta 800, although the citizens were armed all that time, but many other states that have been disarmed have lost their living less than 40 years. And may I ask, what destroyed Rome in the end? Politicians. Oh, is it? Politicians. from within. But, 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 right, it, sword it decayed from within. Yeah. Immorality destroyed Rome, Greece, and all great societies. How's America dying? From the same way. Morality, yeah. We all think we know that, but we always start with spirit. <clears throat> there you go. One, one of the things was also the, the standing army they they were not supposed to ever take the troops across the Rubicon into Rome. That's right. And uh, <clears throat> so, um, you know, when you hear about uh, what's what's the book uh, Crossing Across the Rubicon? Rubicon. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was it was I because that was that's that was the sign that that they had become a tyranny, yep. and of course they fell not long after that. Do you think standing armies day in the U.S. have crossed Rubicon already? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Massabeni wrote in Discovered and Discourse on the first ten books of Titus, said, if any city be armed as Rome was, all the citizens alike in their private and official capacity will be found they will be of the same mind. But when they are not familiar with arms and merely trust to, to the whim of fortune, they will change with the change of fortune. Has American people not changed with the change of ideas? Well, is it that what we tolerated yesterday, we're embracing That's right. today? And, Ho and Hosea 4, 7 says, the more they prospered, the more they forgot me. Yep. Jefferson wrote to George Washington, he said, one, lo one loves to possess arms, though they hope never to have occasion for them. You hear what he said? Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're glad we have them, but we're hoping they're after use them. Right. And Machiavelli said, an armed republic submits less to the rule of one of its citizens. In other words, it will not back down from a tyrant. Adam Smith wrote, men of Republican principles have been jealous for standing army is dangerous of liberty. The standing army of Caesar destroyed the Roman Republic. The standing army of Cromwell returned the long parliament out of the doors. Earl Warren said, this is 1962, Earl Warren said, our war revolution was in good measure fought to protest against standing armies. Thus we find the Bill of Rights and Amendment 2 specifically authorizing a decentralized militia guaranteeing the right to people to keep their arms. This is 1962. Any comments? Political theorist, political theorist is the similar as Nikilo Machiavelli, Sir Thomas More, James Harrington, Arkham and Sydney, and John Locke and Jean Jacques Rousseau all share the same, the same that view that the possession of arms is vital for resisting tyranny, that to be disarmed by one's government is the tenement to being enslaved by it. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Well, I was going to say, not only do we have a standing army that crossed the Rubicon, if you look at Waco, Mm -hmm. They stormed a church and burned it. They did. And shot the people that were trying to come out the back. That's a fact. That's a fact. Yeah. That is a fact. Mahatma, Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi was not considered a violent person. He said this. This is what he said. Among the mis many misdeeds of the British rule in India, his history will look upon it as the act of depriving a whole nation of arms as the blackest. Gandhi said that. Hitler said this. The most foolish mistake we could possibly make would be to allow the sub allow the subjective people to carry arms. History shows that all conquerors who have allowed their subjective people to carry arms have prepared their own fall. Hitler said that. Didn't he liberalize gun ownership in Germany before the regime before him? Oh, be, uh, yeah, then he brought it to the back out. Yeah. Yeah. And Jefferson said this, we most solemnly before God in the world declare that the arms we have been compelled to assume we will use with perseverance, exerting to their utmost energies all those powers which our Creator hath given us to preserve that liberty which He committed to us as a sacred deposit. Amen. A sacred deposit. I must give this in this one with the story. I want to try to read this to you as much as possible. In 1775, on April 19th, Patriots Day, the British continued their march to Lexington and conquered intent not only on seizing arms, but to arrest Boston Tea Party leader Samuel Adams and Massachusetts Pro Provincial Congress, Congress President John Hancock. On the way to Lexington, the British passed through Arlington, Massachusetts. They stormed the inn where lodged the Patriots Eldridge, Gary, Azor Orion, and Jeremiah Lee, 
America's largest colonial ship owner and the wealthiest man in Massachusetts, who was using his ships to smuggle in supplies for the Patriots. Now, this man was a traitor to his country. Let that sink in. He's a British subject. He was, just, he was arming the people against his own government. Would that be called a traitor, Phil? Oh, yeah. Would. Yeah, today, would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The three fled the inn wearing only their night clothes and hid laying on the ground in cold, wet cornfield for hours. Jeremiah Lee caught pneumonia and died a few weeks later. John Hancock, who had previously experienced British tax collectors confiscating his merchant ship Liberty in 1768, led the Massachusetts Public Congress to declare in April, in circumstances dark as these, it becomes us as men and Christians to reflect that whilst every prudent major should be taken to ward off the impending judgment, a day be set apart for a day of public humiliation and prayer. Yes, for prayer, and as men and Christians, we must stand against this. Connecticut Governor Jonathan Thumb Thumball, whom Washington called the first of the Patriots, was the only colonial governor that, that as part of the prayer revolution to support the Patriot cause. He proclaimed April 19, 1775, 1775 this, God would graciously pour out his Holy Spirit on us to bring us to a thorough repentance and effectual reformation that our iniquity may not be our, be our ruin. That he would restore, preserve, and secure the liberties of this and all other British American colonies. Notice he said British. And make the land and mountain of holiness and a habitation of righteousness forever. Mm -hmm. Wow. They had a goal of being the righteous nation. Mm -hmm. there, were, there, there, there they were confronted by Lexington's militia, compared to 77 men who were mostly members of the Church of Christ, pastor of Reverend Jonas Clark, whose wife's cousin was John Hancock. Captain John Parker told the militia, stand your ground, don't fall this far upon them, but if they mean to have war, let it begin here. Now, this we're running out of time so quickly, but I got to try to finish this. Thank you, man. Now, please, let's please stop. Bring up the day. What if we're standing somewhere together as a group, and they come to confiscate our guns or arrest one of our members for not doing anything wrong? We're our brother's keeper. Would that be a? Would that be a? I'm looking for a, a heavy decision to make. Very. And no one knows who fired first, teacher. Nobody knows that for sure. But, but Jonas said that in a sermon preached a year late, a year later, Jonas Clark said this: "Under cover of the darkness, a brigade of these instruments of violence and tyranny make their approach." He said that British army, that they were their army, were were the instruments of violence and tyranny. They entered this town like murderers and cutthroats, without provocation, without warning. When no war was proclaimed, they draw the sword of violence upon the inhabitants of this town. With a cruelty and barbarity which would have made the most hardened savage blush, they shed in some blood. Now, have we shed, has our nation shed in some blood? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Plenty of it. Yeah. Not just with abortion. No. Yeah. And the names of Monroe, Parker, and others that failed victims that age of bloodthirsty oppressors on that gloomy morning, and from the 19th of April 1775, we, we may venture to predict, will be dated in further history the liberty of slavery, the liberty or slavery of the American world, according as a so sovereign God should see fit to smile or frown upon the, the interesting cause which we are engaged. The American militia repeated growing, re, re, uh, retreated, growing to more than 400, and took a stand at Conqueror's Old North Bridge. The British first fired first, wounding four and killing two. Patriot militia commander John Buttrick yelled, "Far for God's sake, fellow soldiers, far!" Taking many casualties, the British began a hasty retreat 20 miles back to Boston. Began boosted along the way by John Parks militia and Parker's revenge. They didn't just go down and stand in front of them and start shooting. They got in the woods behind rocks and behind trees and took them down one at a time. Guerrilla warfare. There you go. Yep. Thus, the Revolutionary War began with an attempt by government officials to seize citizens' guns. Mm -hmm. We have politicians today openly run for president and said, if I'm elected, we will take the guns. Are they not saying that? Yeah. And jail you too. Oh, yes. I'm not, I'm not going to take time to read Paul Revere's ride. They all read that school, I'm sure. At least I think you have. A similar situation occurred on the night of April 26, 1777, when 16-year-old Sybil Ludington mounted her horse, Star, this is a girl now, and frankly rode the alert to American militia in Danbury, Connecticut, under the command of her father, Colonel Henry Ludington, that the British were approaching. So a 16-year-old girl took up within... She within more than Paul Revere. Uh, yeah, I, obviously. Paul Revere didn't make it all the way through, by the way. He was, I he was just passing by the history movie. signs. Uh, <laughs> there in Brewster, New York, oh, yeah. Connecticut. Yeah. <laughs> they, you live better. They... After British captured Charleston, South Carolina on May 12, 1780, 19-year-old Jimmy Blair, by the way, how many of y'all know, know how old Napoleon was? He was young. 16. 18. 
16. 18 years old, and you come and fight with us. 18 year old day, can't even scratch your own hind end. <laughs> it's nerve, it can't stay off the roll. Anyway, after Breach captured Charleston, South Carolina on May 12, 1780, 19-year-old Jimmy Blair was an uh, express rider who, through, though shot in the chest, successfully alerted Americans prior to the Battle of Kings Mountain being memorialized in a poem written by Thomas Trodwell Moore, The Ride of the Rebel. They call him a rebel. Again, I'm going to skip through that. Any comments so far? Well, there's an expression that is... Uh, we should work like everything depends on us, but trust that it Amen. all depends on God. And you know, we're supposed to use our arm of flesh, but not trust Him. Amen. That's, yeah. that, that's yeah. why He gives us the arm of flesh. Right. We're battling spiritual weakness in high places in a fleshly plane. On a fleshly plane, please understand that, folks. What you see happening in America is not physical; it's spiritual. It's been manifested in the physical. A man who rapes a woman or kills an innocent person is evil inside first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two months after the Battle of Lexington conquered, the Continental Congress under President John Hancock declared, June 12, 1775, Congress concerning the present critical, alarming, and calamitous state, directly recommend that Thursday, May 6, July 12, the folks, this government should be done today. We should be declaring a day of, of fasting and prayer before God. And even though that's what we prayed here. Please know that. He says it recommended to Christians of all denominations, this is what he said, to assemble for public worship and to abstain from several, several public labor and recreations of that day. That, so he said get together as believers, no matter what denomination. Day of Atonement. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, isn't it kind of casting off the of shackles of, of uh, doctrines and divisions that came together as unified in Christ Jesus? Yep. But the church hasn't done that today. They're more interested in trying to convert Christians to be in there, you know, Christians converting Christians. And they forgot what the world is all about, and now we're uh, reaping the rewards of it. Okay, I think I made it. Go ahead, Dick. My neighbor, uh, we've got mom in Mexico down at Morris, Morris, uh, everybody got in the, in the big room together for their treatment of patients. And as we found a military man there from Brownsville, Texas, he was up here, he was quite that old and bad. His wife was there for cancer treatment. He made a statement while we was there, we was all talking. He said, uh, this is 91, spring of 91, he said, I feel that we should illegal all guns and uh, uh, take them all for America. It's, he, he was for gun control. You said that? As a uh, young military guy from oh. Brownsville, Texas. He said they should have all, all guns and confiscate all guns in America. Mm -hmm. That was 1991. He had military retired. And he was old enough to know better. And his wife died while he was there. Really? No lack of stupidity. No. Well, I have a t-shirt that would get those people. It says, excuse me, you're stupid showing. You yeah. think you might should tuck it in? No, I wasn't <laughs> really right, but you think you should well, tuck it in? In closing, I take this teaching very, very seriously on me. And I would ask everybody that's watching this now or later, search for themselves in the scriptures. And we as a group together, whether it's ten of us or a thousand of us, we seek our Lord's face in prayer and ask for direction. Only a madman wants bloodshed. And only a coward would halt, if necessary, in defending himself in hand. Wickedness will not succumb to our pleading. Wickedness only succumbs to force and justice. You understand that? No, no tyrant has ever said, because you said, please, I won't stop. Or because you told me, hey, this is your, this is your right in the Bible, I won't stop. It doesn't work. Once the power is given to them to become tyrants, they never surrendered without a battle. And I have to say, folks, we're there now. Well, one thing people don't realize, too, once a person gives their rights over to Satan, not rights, their duties to Satan, they come in agreement with him, they establish that uh, covenant with him. And many times, a couple of people I've worked with in ministry say, it's just like, you know, these demon spirits literally took my hand and forced me to do something. And I didn't want to do it, but they did it. 
You mm. surrender. Yeah, you surrender over to the dark side, you give the full 100% authority of your life. All right, two minutes left. A quick call if you hurry. Two minutes. Two minutes. You want to call, hurry. I know this teaching was, was very hard and straightforward in a sense, but I know it's a very heavy teaching. I can't answer for you. But I know what the Bible says for me. You know, you want to say anything in closing? No. Anybody else? All right, Lord willing, we'll be back here on the first Saturday of June. No, we'll, we'll be we'll here. Be we'll be at Bill's house. Be at Bill's house. You too. The first Saturday of June. We love you. See you there. Bye bye. You too.